for checking out this interview. We've had uh, a lot of really great guests so far and a lot of really great interviews. And uh, I'm very excited about the one we're doing today. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be sitting with uh, Miss Kathleen Flanagan, who is a former Washington State Poet Laureate and obviously has some ties to the Manhattan Project. Uh, welcome, Miss Flanagan. Thank you, Dennis. It's nice to be with you. Thanks for thinking of this. Absolutely. Um, your work is so moving. Um, right here, I'm sitting next to her work, Plume, which was inspired by the Manhattan Project and is her collection of poetry inspired by her time growing up in Richland, Washington, uh, near the Hanford site, and actually having worked there for a while as well. Is that correct? That's right. Great. So a little bit about Miss Flanagan. I'll tell you a little bit about her, and then uh, she'll start us off by reading from Plume. Uh, Miss Flanagan is the author of three poetry collections, Plume, as we've talked about, is a meditation on the Hanford nuclear site and her hometown of Richland, Washington. It won the Washington State Book Award and was a finalist for the William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America and the Pacific Northwest Book Awards. Her first book, Famous, won the Prairie Schooner, 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 Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry and was named a notable book by the American Library Association. Her third poetry collection, Post Romantic, has been selected for the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series and will be published by the University of Washington Press this fall. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, her awards include a Pushcart Prize and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and Artist Trust. She served as Washington State Poet Laureate from 2012 to 2014. She teaches poetry in the schools through arts agencies like Writers in the Schools and Jack Straw. For 13 years, she was an editor at Floating Bridge Press, a nonprofit press dedicated to publishing Washington State poets and currently serves on the board of Jack Straw, which is an audio art studio and cultural center. She holds a Master of Fine Arts degree in creative writing from Pacific Lutheran University, as well as a bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering. So which poem have you selected for us? So I'm gonna be reading from Plume, and um, I thought I would start with the poem, The Cold War. And the reason I chose this poem is because it's, it creates a, a perspective for what we're going through right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think for people of a certain age, particularly, when I think back, I think about the fears I have had about being uh, confined to home. And those fears were often around the idea of a nuclear disaster of some kind. And so everything that we're going through now to me is sort of compared to that original fear that I had. So I, I thought I'd read this poem because that describes that, that background that I have that was always in the back of my mind. Wonderful. The Cold War. It will turn quaint soon enough. Bomb shelters already charm us, stuffed to their low ceilings with batteries, board games, and cans. Sardines are amusing, and pineapple rings for dessert. Old footage of duck and cover drills inspires us to be world-weary and ironic, to, embra to embrace the futile. Once we considered A-bombs big, then H-bombs exploded over the South Pacific. We can laugh now at Khrushchev and his shoe, beauty queens in radiation suits. I'd wake bolt upright in my bed, afraid of a flash to come. I'd buy books and extra spaghetti to provide for our last days and pray that our end be painless. I wasn't even that young. I remember the red phone and missile codes, how every movie hinged on a clock ticking down. We called it the arms race and there were two sides. It was simple. Beautiful, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I love your work, it's so, so moving and especially being an artist from Richland myself definitely really hits home for me. Thank you, that's wonderful to hear. I, I, I think that the arts are really an important way for us to sort of make peace with um, a background like we share, um, making sense of the legacy of our hometown. Um, and I'm pretty sure that you felt that too, that there's something really cathartic about being able to make art out of it. So I appreciate that very much. Yes, absolutely. 
So tell us a little bit about your connection to the Hanford site and the Manhattan Project and growing up in Richland, just to give us some context. Sure. Um, so I was born in 1960 into a family of five, and my father was a research chemist and worked out at the what we used to call the area, um, the Hanford site. And I grew up, went to the local schools. Um, I left, I went to Washington State University and then came back with an engineering degree. And I worked out at Hanford uh, in the 200 areas for three years um, as an engineer, mostly working in what we called the hydrogeology unit, where we were actually monitoring um, wells to uh, keep track of the um, movement of contaminants in the groundwater towards the Columbia River. So I felt at the time it was really important work. Um, and I'm really glad that I was part of that world. And of course, being out there was a very different thing than, than living next to it all my childhood. I'm sure you could, we could talk about that for a long time. But one of the things that I've come away with is this sort of strange feeling that the Hanford site, which is, you know, the most contaminated waste site in our hemisphere and the most expensive environmental cleanup in the world. Um, I think of Hanford as sort of part and parcel of my hometown. I feel that that whole world was all one piece and that it included the site and it included our town and included our little neighborhood. And even though I wasn't allowed to go out there as a kid, I still felt a kind of familiarity with it. Um, but to actually go out there as a working person was a whole nother deal. <laughs> so it was really strange to go out and actually be next to some of these places that I'd heard a little bit about, or at least I'd seen from the Vernita Highway um, from a distance. And it was, it's a scary place to be. I mean, um, you are taught from day one that you don't go places that you have no business being and you don't talk about things that you have no business talking about. So it was a whole new level of learning the code and learning the culture um, from the inside uh, out. So yeah, it was really, really interesting. Wow. That is, it's amazing to hear as well. Um, my father works at the site as well. And which was my personal connection and some of the parallels that you mentioned and are so similar to what he mentions even today as well. Yeah. 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 And you know, it's, it's where all my, my dad worked and all my parents' friends, the, at least the dads worked out there and the neighbors and yet no one ever talked about it. So we learned without even being told what we were being taught was that we didn't talk about that place. It, you know, our, our dads came home, they never talked about work, we used to kid about that. And so there was this sort of code of secrecy that surrounded that environment. And at the time, we thought it was kind of cute, you know, it was sort of, um, it was, it made us different than other communities in ways that we, you know, as children, we kind of embraced, you know, we do things differently than other people. And now looking back, I think it was a really dangerous thing to be um, basically taught not to talk about these things made the, you know, a huge opportunity for, for the site and its environmental degradations and all the contamination to go unchecked and un, you know, unattended to for way too long. So secrecy is, is not a good thing. Hmm. So you've maybe touched on a little bit as well, uh, but you've obviously had several sex successful poetry collections and you're recognized poets. So what compelled you to write this specific work, Plume? Well, you know, it's interesting from the outside, it looks like a book of, it's like, you might call it environmental poetry or you might call it activist poetry, um, political poetry, but that is not at all what it was for me. This is entirely a book about identity. This is me trying to figure out who I am and where I came from. And so for me, these poems are extremely personal, even though they are talking about large scale issues, 
for me, that's, that's part of who I am. And so it's really an exploration of, of where I come from and what that makes me as a result. So I want to dive in a little bit to a specific part of your backstory, which is the time that you spent working at the Hanford site. Mm -hmm. uh, you spent three years out there and I would like to ask you what it was like to go to work there after you'd grown up during the Cold War and in your own words from Plume, you watched every father you knew disappear to fuel the bomb. Right. Um, well, I have this very romantic memory and it's also, I actually wrote a poem about it, which you quoted a line from about the first time I saw the Hanford site. I was, I had a summer job that worked at the outskirts of the site, but I wasn't allowed on, you know, inside the gates basically. So my dad, um, made special arrangements for me to get a, a one day badge so that he could take me through the gates and drive me through the site. We never got out of the car. He just drove me. And we were probably, we probably drove 75 miles that afternoon. I remember it was a Friday afternoon in August. And he just drove me past all these places that I'd heard about. He drove me past the ghost towns. He drove me past the 200 east and west areas where we couldn't get inside, but we could at least see all these um, smokestacks and these, and he drove me out to the 100 areas so we could actually see the old reactors. And this is before they were mothballed. Um, so I got to actually see it for the first time with my dad. And that was an incredible experience. So after I graduated from college, I had already had that initial introduction but there were all these other parts, like getting the, the real badge, the, the real badge that let me in and out. It felt kind of like getting, learning the secret handshake, you know, that our dads all knew, but we didn't. Um, so there were, it was like conferring adulthood on me in a strange kind of way. I had, I had the physical manifestations that this proves I'm a grown up because I have a badge now too, and I work out there too. So there's a lot in that to unpack as I sort of approached it. And then I would, I'd take the bus out there and I'd seen those buses driving around Richland my whole life. And I'd seen the dads and moms getting on and getting off. And so for me to be riding one of those buses too was, was really so interesting. It's, it's like, it's like learning all the secret things that you always wondered about. Um, but, you know, along with that, knowledge comes a little bit of fear, a little bit of disappointment, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, questions about ethics. And I always felt that the people I worked with were really good. I was working in the environmental field and it attracts a certain kind of person for sure. But I felt with everyone that I met that people were doing the best they could. You know, it wasn't a matter of, of, you know, evil people doing bad things. I, but there's something about that culture of secrecy where only some people know things and other people know other things and they, nobody knows everything except for a very few people that is not good for, mm -hmm. for safety. It's not good for the environment. So I learned a lot about that sort of firsthand. Did you have to live in a little silver trailer? <laughs> I our office our office was in a triple wide trailer for a oh, while wow. and then which is even more exciting they moved us into an an uh previous high uh high level what do they call it a hot lab so it had been a laboratory where they did radioactive work wow. and um when we moved it was it had been turned over into an office building and they, one of the things I always remember is they said, if you see yellow paint, call us. So I guess what they did is they put this, you know, I think it must have been lead paint over the, the walls to make sure that there was no radiation contamination. And then they right. would paint over the top of that. So it was like, wow. okay, I hope not to see any yellow paint. <laughs> that's incredible. I've, I've never talked to anyone who's had that experience. That's amazing. Yeah, and that's just an office building. <laughs> it's a it's like a it's like a treasure hunt out there yeah yeah well a lot of it's gone now it's you know mm -hmm. which is good i mean the building i worked in is gone it's just leveled um 
and you know they're doing such important work out there all that mm -hmm. commissioning and it's such dangerous work i have nothing but but admiration for the people who are working out there absolutely so you touched a little bit on this with your selection of the first poem um, but there are obviously some parallels between what we're experiencing now with COVID-19 and this kind of global anxiety and the same kind of aura that was around during the Cold War, where no one's really sure what's going to happen and the threat of uh, mass destruction and death is more present and uh, easy to observe in our lives than maybe ever before. Yeah. So in your opinion, what role does an artist like yourself have in times of anxiety like this? Well, I really think the most important thing that artists can do is make us feel connected to other people. It's, I mean, we are literally separated from one another. You know, we're, we're locked down, most of us still, and um, we're coming out of that, but we're wearing masks, which is a strange kind of um, disconnection with other folks. You can't read people's expressions. And all of that just feels like a metaphor for this, this disjointedness and the separation and you might argue our politics do it to us too and i feel like the first role of of art is to connect us to something larger than ourselves and connect us to each other i definitely feel that about poetry i think about reading poems sitting down with a book of poems and that experience of of feeling like i'm in someone else's shoes for a moment and reading what it is for this for this poet to be alive, how they experience the world. And I feel both that connection, like, oh, I felt that too. I know exactly what that is. Or, and sometimes it's, I don't know what that's like, but for a moment, I kind of can see what it feels like. And we have to have that. That's where empathy comes from. And we, we really need to be empathetic. Absolutely. And you've touched on one of the things that I love about being a musician myself too, is the way that it can, bring people together and kind of um give you a look a view into someone else's life um you know i feel that i'm most effective as an artist when i can show someone through my instrument through my music what it means to be me right exactly right yeah and you can do it in this non-verbal way that is sort of mysterious to all of us and yet we all understand it too it's it's a beautiful thing i just music is an amazing gift to the world <laughs> absolutely uh has music inspired any of your poetry as well um because it seems to me that your poetry has a very musical element to it like a lot of good poetry does but yours in particular seems to reflect um kind of folk traditions or some of the music you associate with some of the the region out here that that's really nice thank you um music is very important to me i grew up playing piano and singing and um so I, I do feel like that one of the powers of poetry is that it can bring music in and, you know, sort of you can deliver your message in, in sort of complicated ways that you may not even understand as you're laying it down, but that sound has a big part of delivering the message of a poem. Um, so I don't, I don't, I have written poems to music. I've written poems that sort of inspired by music, but mostly for me, it's it's just about um, the music of language leading me forward in a poem. Like it will, as you're writing, words sort of introduce themselves to you or they make themselves available to you because the sound, there's a ringing that you're starting to hear and it kind of pulls you through a poem as you're writing it and as you're reading it. So that's that's where music is for me in, in a poem. That's amazing. And um, as a musician, so so I guess validating and exciting to hear as well. It's, oh, this is so fun. I wish we could do this for hours. Um, <laughs> uh, so I have one, one final question for you. And then it would be amazing if you could read another one of your poems for us. Sure. Um, in your opinion, as someone who grew up in Richland and has connections to Hanford and the Manhattan Project, and kind of the remnants of atomic culture and the atomic bomb. Uh, are there any lasting impacts or influences that you think these things have had in our culture that we can observe today, or are they kind of in the rear view mirror now? Well, I don't think we ever are. We, we're never going to stop being able to destroy ourselves. I think that's the most, <laughs> the 
the most obvious lasting imp impulse. And, and um, I think as anybody who's been born since World War II, each one of us has to sort of reenact that loss of innocence. It's just some point where we learned, oh, we can destroy humanity. We have the power to do so. And so for each young person that, that comes into the world, they have that moment of understanding. And so that's never going to go away. I think we have more ways to do it now. I think we can do it the slow way or we can do it the fast way. But um, so there is that. Um, I think I think I'd go back to that idea of secrecy too. I think learning, if we could only just remember how dangerous it is it dangerous it is for us to keep secrets from ourselves and um how how damaging that is to democracy and it's easy to just sort of surrender complicated things to the people up up top and i just think that's so dangerous we we can't afford to do that so i'm hoping that one legacy of the manhattan project is that we will learn we have to keep tabs on everything that we're doing in our country, scientific and, and political and all, every aspect of, of what we're doing. I just think secrecy is, is just an anathema to democracy. Absolutely. Well, great. Do you have a poem for us? I do. I'm going to finish up with a poem that is, well, I, it's called Bedroom Community, and I, I named it that because that's what people used to call Richland. I don't know if they say that anymore, but when I was very young, I remember hearing that expression, Richland is a bedroom community, and I never really knew what it meant. Well, what, they, what it meant was it's, it's a little town built especially for the Hanford site. You know, it wouldn't be there otherwise, or it wouldn't be in its form, but I decided to play with that idea of the bedroom community. And this poem includes a reference to my friend Carolyn and her father. And mm -hmm. in other poems in the book, it, it, it's revealed that Carolyn's father ends up dying of a radiation illness, but she was my best friend growing up and she lived just up the street. Okay, bedroom community. We were all bedded down in our nightcaps, curtains drawn, as swamp coolers and sprinklers hissed every brown summer hour, or in winter, sagebrush hardened in the cold. It was still dark as our fathers rose, dressed, and boarded blue buses that pulled away. And men in milk trucks came collecting bottled urine from our doorsteps. Beyond the shelter belt of Russian olive trees, cargo trains shuffled past at eight and eight, and the wide Columbia rolled by, silent with walleye and steelhead. We pulled up our covers while our overburdened fathers dragged home to fix the drink, and some of them grew sick. Carolyn, your father's marrow testified. Whistles from the train, the buses came, our fathers left. Oh, Carolyn while the rest of us slept. That's so beautiful. Um, man, I, I get chills just listening to your poetry. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Um, and thank you for sitting down with me and having this talk. Um, oh, that's appreciate my it pleasure. so, so much. We have to stick together as Richland types. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, I encourage everybody to check out uh, uh, Ms. Flanagan's book, Plume and uh give it a good read read it multiple times read it a hundred times it's wonderful um and check out re-manhattan project and um thank you for checking this out great thank you thanks Dennis.